Hello, everybody. Uh, I apologise for the change of title. Uh, when I first put this talk in, it's something about BB84 and RSA and so on. Um, but actually, I prefer this title. It's the same talk. Trust me. So, trust, trust me, that's me. I'm James. I, um, I'm a consultant, which kind of means that I do exactly what I want to do. Most of the time, I do stuff like I talked about yesterday, which is to try and help companies improve their delivery operation. But occasionally, I get to do cool stuff like learning about quantum computers, which is really cool. Oh, yeah, and fun fact, I suffer from face blindness. All of you in this room look exactly the same to me. True. What am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about cryptography. Uh, that's kind of a lie. I'm going to talk about sort of quantum computers, or oh, maybe that's a lie as well. It's, it's a popular science talk. I hope you all enjoy it. Let's move on. Uh, apologies to those that were in yesterday, but that's my Eurostar ticket, which says London St. Pancras to any Belgian station. Well, I thought Antwerp was in Belgium, but when I tried to get on a train from Brussels to Antwerp, this happened. Which was, you know, quite irritating at the time. But then uh, I had to get a different train. It took me hours and hours and hours. But eventually I got to Antwerp Station, which I think is one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. It's one of the only multi-storey stations I know of. And look at it from the outside. What a wonderful building that is. Didn't even know it had this other aspect, because the last time I came to Antwerp, I didn't walk around that side of the station. So, hey, who knew? Um, that's me working yesterday. Nobody needs to know that. My hotel room, which I know Alistair that I can see over there knows this because he's in the same hotel, looks like a prison cell. It was the worst hotel I've ever stayed in. So yesterday I tried to run from the hotel straight to the conference. As you can see from my Strava trace, it didn't quite go to plan. I might have gone the wrong way at the very start. And, but to prove I got here, there you go. There's, there's the picture of me, a little bit sweaty. Uh, this I did yesterday. Uh, thank you to all of you that came to my talk yesterday. It was fun. It was actually really enjoyed it. Uh, but then, of course, what happened after the talks? Well, uh, Guy Royce, who did a talk today, um, had a full bottle of whiskey when I met him. Like he called it like bourbon, American bourbon, and, and that's what it looked like an hour later, which wasn't all that helpful, to be fair. Um, and this is a guy called Dimitri. I think he's another speaker. In fact, I can see him right there. Did I get your name right? Yes, excellent. Uh, we decided to get the train from just down the road to Central to go to the IBM party. I, I, I still don't understand why we did that, but that's us getting the train. Anyway, let's get on to real stuff. Cryptography. Who in this room understands cryptography? Excellent. I'm really pleased. Time for a quick pub quiz. Are pub quizzes just British, or do they happen elsewhere in the world as well? I always wonder about this. Anyway, does anybody know who these three gentlemen are? Guesses are welcome. Sure. Someone said sure. No. Oh, good guess. Hold that thought. They are Ellis, Williamson, and Cox. And by the way, if you're British, Clifford Cox's name is really funny. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's funny in other languages, but in English, it's brilliant. Does anybody want to guess who these two, these two people are? Yes, somebody here said Diffie and Hellman. Actually, they're not. They're Hellman and Diffie. <laughs> I put them the other way around just to fool people. OK, who, who can guess these people? Somebody said it earlier. RSA, thank you. Do you know their names? Rivest Shaw Shamir, sorry. An Edelman, I shouldn't talk about Shaw. Shaw comes into this story later. OK, we'll come back to these people. This is what cryptography is all about. Alice wants to send a message to Bob. No idea why we chose those names, probably A and B. Eve is the evil eavesdropper. No idea again if that joke works in other languages. I wasn't the person that invented it. But the crucial point here is that, underneath where I've got Eve, she needs to read the message without Alice and Bob knowing that she's read the message. Reading that message is worthless if they know. And that was illustrated perfectly during the Second World War, for example, where the British and the Americans had totally broken the German codes. 
but they couldn't act on all that intelligence because they knew that if they acted on it, it would be obvious they'd read the messages. So they constantly had to assess whether to act or not to act on what they learnt, which obviously down the years has been quite controversial. Public key cryptography is about finding something that is easy to do in one direction and hard to do in the other direction. So typically, if you multiply together two numbers, that's easy to do. To factorize that larger number is hard. And in fact, that's what RSA is based on. It's of sub-exponential complexity. I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. But what it does mean practically is that um, the current length of keys that we have, 2048-bit keys, are, uh, will take something like 40 years for the most powerful computers that currently existed to decrypt them. Um, if you were to use a 3072-bit key, which some computers now are using, some systems are using, uh, if you could build a computer, a classical computer, you, which uses every electron in the universe, and there are about 10 to the 80 electrons in the universe, if you could build that computer, it would take that computer longer than the lifetime of the universe to decrypt a 3072-bit key. So according to the boundaries of classical computing, RSA is pretty safe. OK, so let's talk about quantum computing. Who in this room, apart from Alastair Collinson, has used classical uh, quantum computers? You're allowed to put your hand up, Alastair. Go on. So just me and Alastair, then. OK. I'm going to talk very briefly about what a uh, quantum computer is. This is classical computing. Everything that classical computers does is about bits, zeros and ones. On the left, what you've got there is a logical OR gate. If either A or B is closed, the light comes on. Or if they're both closed, the light comes on. If you put together a load of those logic gates, they process all the bits coming through and they do more complex stuff. So what we're seeing on the, the right-hand picture there is a schematic of 16-bit... Um, uh, Yes, 16-bit floating-point arithmetic. So that's how a computer implements floating-point arith arithmetic through logic, excuse me, through logic gates. That's all classical computers do. When you sum up all of those things together, you get more complex, more interesting operations, and they do some cool stuff, as we all know. What about quantum computers? Well, they have something called a qubit, which is a bit like a bit. Excuse me for overloading the word bit there. It's a bit like a bit, um, in that when you measure its value, it will either tell you I'm 0 or I'm 1. However, until you measure the value, it's somewhere in between. Or in fact, more correctly, I'm trying not to look at Alistair because he understands this stuff better than me. More correctly, it holds 0 and 1 simultaneously. Or at least when you use it in a computation, the computation will use both 0 and 1. But as soon as you look at the value, as soon as you observe it, the value becomes deterministically 0 or 1, which is a limitation on quantum computing. Here's a little picture of what one can imagine a single qubit to look like. The, the Greek letter on the right there that looks like a toasting fork, uh, I think that's psi, um, that shows the quantum state. The closer it is to the top of the sphere, the more likely it is to return 0 when you measure its value. The closer it is to the bottom of the sphere, the more likely it is to return 1 when you measure its value. Don't get too attached to that picture, though. <laughs> and like classical computers, we have this thing called gate-based computing, where you have logic gates a bit like you do in classical computers. This screenshot is from the IBM Q. Uh, which I used to have a link to on this slide, but I seem to have lost it somewhere along the way. Uh, you can set up a free account on IBM Q to learn about quantum computing. The interesting gates in here, well, they're all interesting. Uh, X, Y, and Z do basically transform the arrow from this picture here through 180 degrees in one of the planes. And the only other interesting gate that I'm going to talk about is the H gate, the Hadamard gate. And what that does is, generally speaking, when your qubit 
starts the program in the state pointing straight up. When you apply the Hadamard gate, it rotates it through 90 degrees, so it's pointing to the right. So what that means is that it holds both the value 0 and 1 simultaneously for computational purposes, and it has an equal probability of returning either when you measure it. That's all we need to know right now. You're welcome to come to the pub with me and discuss this at length. OK. Has anybody heard of superposition? Excellent. Fantastic. That's the property of holding 0 and 1. And interference. Interference is a thing I'm just going to give a quick demonstration of. Because it is utterly crucial for quantum computers. There it is. This is the bit where all the technology goes badly wrong. See? I told you. I'll start again. I'm going to reproduce the double slit experiment. So this is Ben, this is Jack. I'm going to start again, just because we missed it. The three of us have been trying to reproduce the double slit experiment. So this is Ben, this is James, and I'm James as well. We've used equipment that you can find anywhere. Well, 3D printer maybe. Yeah. Wow. Down here, we made a frame and a holder for our double slit. We made the double slit by using a sharp knife in between some tin foil. Here we have a laser pointer. It's the same laser pointer that I'm going to be using during the presentation. It's so not, by the way. I might even reproduce it if I've got this equipment, but it will probably end up in the bin later. Down this end, we've got 3D models of Ben. We've got Big Ben and medium sized Ben. Little Ben we left on the table over there somewhere. And they're holding our screen to receive the results. So let's see if we can make a diffraction, uh, an interference pattern at the other end of this desk. It's very scientifically done this. And uh, there it is. Can we see the interference pattern? And that is quantum physics in action as demonstrated for you in the ThoughtWorks office. Thank you very much. OK, so why am I showing that video? Because well, with a quantum computer. Can we get a really good shot of it? Oh, god. Why is it starting again? <coughs> OK. In a quantum computer, the qubits interact together. They interfere. So let's, let's talk about the history of that experiment first. That experiment that we just saw is called Young's double slit experiment. There should be an apostrophe there, and I'm really annoyed that when I gave my presentation to the designer person that he dropped the apostrophe. I'm, I need to take that up with him tomorrow. Uh, Newton postulated. Uh, that light travelled through particles that he called corpuscles. And nobody challenged that view for many, many centuries, indeed. Um, but then people started challenging it. And I think it was 1809 that a, a person called Young in the UK, I think he was Scottish, he devised the double slit experiment to demonstrate that light does not travel as particles. It travels as waves. And his conjecture was that if I can demonstrate that there is interference between the waves, I've demonstrated that light travels as waves. And that's the experiment that we just saw. You see the bright spots and the dark spots, and it demonstrates that interference happens. So light travels in waves, right? Well, no, it doesn't. Because when quantum physics started to become a thing at the start of the 20th century, everybody realized that, well, actually, light does not travel in waves. Light travels in tiny little particles called photons. So as they go through the double slit, those photons interfere with each other. So all of the quantum physicists of the time got together and they agreed that there's something called wave-particle duality. So these are photons, which are particles, but they also behave like waves. They, they, they share the characteristics of particles and waves. And therefore, as a load of photons, as you can see in this picture, go through the double slits together, they will naturally interfere with each other. They show the, the wave part of the wave particle duality. Great. So that explains everything. Oh, hang on. And then in, I think it was in the 1940s, 
when the equipment got more sophisticated, it became possible to design an experiment, much like what we saw on this slide, but where you can guarantee that there is only one photon traveling at the same time. So you can send a single photon through the double slits onto the detector beyond. So therefore, there is no other photons to interfere with. And yet, as the photons arrive at the detector, one by one, they still make this interference pattern. So what is happening? Well, the answer is, well, open to, to reason. But um, the belief of the many worlds interpretation, uh, David Deutsch, amongst other scientists, uh, like first postulated by Wheeler, I think, in the 1950s, is that the, the photon goes through every possible path. Now, you might think that there's an infinite number of paths through those double slits, but there aren't, because actually space is not a continuous quantity as, as we would most interpret it. Space is divided into tiny little subunits. So there is actually... A, a limited number of paths that the photon can go through to get from the emitter to the detector through these double slits. When it travels in that fashion, it goes through every path simultaneously. We can only see one of the paths it goes through, but there are other universes that it exists in which that photon goes through every possible path. Why is that important? Well, firstly, I can't do a talk without talking about my daughter's cat. That's my daughter's cat. The cat is showing indifference, because that's what cats do. So some time ago, with me and my daughter, we got together and said, can we impose a superposition thing on the cat? I don't know if these moods interact or interfere, but can we do superposition of moods? Well, what we found out was that actually we can impose a superposition of moods. Always worried about that joke in a language that isn't English. Back to the serious stuff. Has anybody worked with the Fourier transform? OK, so a lot of people know about that. It's, it's a digital signal processing thing that essentially, and I know I'm simplifying, translates the time domain to the frequency domain. It makes it easier to squash signals and, and send them. In a quantum computer, there's something called the quantum Fourier transform. That that we're looking at there is a schematic of, of how one would implement it. Uh, each line represents a single qubit, and the circular bits, uh, the circular parts, are representing logic gates that they go through. Essentially, it's exactly the same as the classical Fourier transform. It converts things from the time domain to the frequency domain. And what it's taking advantage of there, as you can see, there are those links, those dark blobs that link to the ones above. It's taking advantage of interference. So however many qubits you've got in your system, the Fourier transform is exploiting that interference to give us some useful result. It's allowing us to understand the periodicity of things rather than the result of things. So why is that important? Well, I love this picture, by the way. That was, that was my design. And I'll give him a pat on the back for that one, because there's no, there's no missing apostrophe. Um, the elephant in the room. Is that a phrase in languages that aren't English? I don't know. Shaw's algorithm. Has anybody heard of Shaw's algorithm? Oh, a few people. Does anybody understand it? <laughs> Thanks, Alistair. <laughs> this is how it works. You pick a random number that you're going to factorize n. So you pick a random number less than n. You see if it actually is accidentally a factor. Oh. There's a missing letter there. That should say done, not Don. <laughs> We've found a factor, so we are Don. I don't know who Don is, but hey, nice to meet you. Step four, use the quantum period finding routine. Step five gives you this interesting algebraic relationship. And then it tells you that that. So it's easier to illustrate by example, which I will now do. Imagine we're trying to factorize 15. So we choose any number less than 15. So let's say we chose 2 randomly. The greatest common divisor of 2 and 15 is 1, so 2 is not a factor of 15. So we go to the next step. Now, the period of 2 to the x mod 15 is 4. What does that mean? 2 
squared is 4. 2 to the power 3 is 8. 2 to the power 4 is 16, which is 1 mod 15. So if we continue to raise 2 to successive powers, the calculation will go 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. So the period of 2 with respect to 15, 2 to the x with respect to 15 is 4. Now what that tells us is that 2 squared minus 1 and 2 squared plus 1 will yield up the factors of 15. So 2 squared minus 1 is 3. 2 squared plus 1 is 5. So I think we can all see that that worked. That algorithm worked. OK. Now, that's a very trivial example, obviously. Now I need my glasses, because I know this next bit is going to be tiny. Oh, no one needs to see about NP complete. But uh, here we go. Is that it? Oh, no, that's my marathon times. Right. One day on the way to work, I wanted to test Shaw's algorithm and understand its complexity and understand how it worked. So I, at random, I say at random, I picked a number, which is that number there, 1,517. And I thought, right, I'm going to apply Shaw's algorithm in a spreadsheet to understand how complex it is to understand the workings of it. Seemed like a logical step for me. So, as you can see, I first chose the number 4, um, which is obviously a number less than 1,517. And there you go, I'm raising it to successive powers. It goes 16, 64, 256, 1,024, then 4,096, which is 1,062, when you take it mod 1,517. So as you can see the, on the right-hand column there, I'm, I'm raising it to successive powers, and they're taking it mod 1,517. So eventually, it will come back to 1. The maximum number of cycles can, can only be 1,517, because it's a closed number field, obviously. So let's have a look. We scroll down, we scroll down, we scroll down, we scroll down. Eventually there, I get back to 1. So the period of 4, um, 4 to the n with respect to 1,517 is 90. That's cool. What that tells us is that 4 to the power 45 minus 1 and 4 to the power 45 plus 1 are multiples of the factors of 1,517. Fantastic. However, if we scroll up, we see that column C is blank because the numbers overflowed there. So that wasn't any good for my demonstration. So I decided to try other numbers. And oh, you can see I've done this talk recently. So um, 16 has a period of 45. Now that's not useful because it has to be an even number because I need to be able to do the half period. I need to do 16 to the power 22 and a half, which is not an integer. Or at least I assume it's not. Uh, and that overflowed anyway. So then I tried all these other numbers. And what we're seeing here is that this computation is very complex. 23. And then I think, if I remember rightly, I got to 10 and thought, oh, I got excited. Because the period was low enough that it didn't overflow. But unfortunately, the period was 15. So that didn't help me. Eventually, and it did take me half a day, I found that 14 was useful for me. So, as we can see, the period of 14 is 24. But crucially, the half period, 12, 14 to the power 12, has not overflowed in Google Sheets. So that gives me an integer that I can work with. So, how did I use that? Well, uh, let's go back to this. Oh, we don't need to see this slide again. Apologies. There's my spreadsheet. So we randomly chose a number less than 1,517, but 10 was no good because its period was odd. Then we found 14. So 14 isn't a divisor of 1,005. That's the wrong number. It should be what should say 1,517. My god, that's dreadful. Excuse me a moment. Let's start that slide again. Just, just pretend that didn't happen. OK. So the period of 14 is 24. 14 to the 12 minus 1 is that massive number, which is a multiple of 37. 
14 to the 12 plus 1 is that other massive number, which is a multiple of 41. Hey presto, we factorise 1,517. However, where's the magic in that? How would a quantum computer help? Well, step number four says use the quantum period finding routine to find the period of a to the x mod n. What we saw in that spreadsheet was that the complexity of finding the period of a number with respect to another in that calculation is intractable. In fact, that step for a classical computer is of exponential complexity. So it's, it's intractable. It's the same as, as using the sieve of Aristophanes or, or the other. That's not the most efficient way to factorize a number, but it's, it's the same. But imagine if we could go back to my spreadsheet here. Um, oh, hang on a minute. I need to hit escape, don't I? If we could come to this um, spreadsheet, we don't actually care about all those big numbers. We don't care about the results of the calculation in column C or column D or column E. All we care about is that number there. In this case, 180. So imagine if we could find a way to just find the period, but without doing all those calculations. Now, this is the power of the quantum computer, because by using the interference between the, the, the qubits in the system, we can do exactly that. We use the quantum Fourier transform against a quantum register, and we raise that register. So if we're factorizing 15, we'll have four bits in the register. We then do uh, two to the power this register. And what happens is the quantum computer makes all of those calculations simultaneously because all bar one of them is taking place in a different universe. But because quantum systems interfere with the other universes that we can't see, we can derive the, the period from it by using the quantum Fourier transform. And by the way, I don't fully understand it. I'm still trying to get my head around it. All I know is that David Deutsch claims that the fact that quantum computers have successfully factorized numbers shows that parallel universes exist. If you go to my GitHub, there it is, you'll see my implementation of Shor's algorithm in Microsoft's Q-sharp language. Um, on the other hand, if you want to see a better implementation, go to this GitHub. This is my ex-colleague from ThoughtWorks, and he used Shor's algorithm, uh, he made a much better implementation than me when I was working with him. But as you can see, it took an hour and a half for his Mac to factorize 35, which demonstrates the complexity still of, of the algorithm. So, is RSA dead? Well, Shor's algorithm to implement it in a true quantum computer requires about three times as many qubits as the size of the key. So to factorize a 2048-bit key, which we're currently using, would require about 6,000 qubits. That is a long way off. We know of a computer that uh, Rigetti owns. We know of the Google's claim about quantum supremacy, but these computers are in the region of 100 qubits. But as soon as quantum supremacy is demonstrated, which I'm not sure it has been yet, I think that's still open to dispute, it's a reasonable bet that a lot more investment will follow and quantum computing will, I think, take off on a kind of exponential trajectory of, um, of technology. So what do we do if RSA dies? What if our RSA stuff is worthless? Well, BB84 exists. It first came around in 1984, and I'll talk about that in a moment. There are some classical algorithms that we can use. RLWE, uh, which I haven't got on this slide. Ring learning with errors, I'm told, is quantum safe, but I'll qualify that by saying, yeah. So let's talk about BB84 and other quantum safe algorithms. So, oh, Alistair supplied me with this. Apparently, that's BB8. <laughs> Who knew? Alistair knew. Um, RLWE is alleged to be quantum safe, meaning that we can implement it in our current computing systems and it should be safe from quantum attack. Um, however, there are drawbacks. The reasons why we're not using it in our browsers is that it imposes a performance overhead. The keys are very big 
and it will make our computers run slower. So at the moment, nobody sees it as a viable thing to do. Now, I asked, this email exchange came from uh, today. Uh, this guy, Rupesh, is a professor in, in Oxford University, and he just sent me that note. Claims being made about protection from quantum computers may not be reliable. Okay. And I think this is a reasonable thing to say. So my response was that. Um, I think I'm right in saying that Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us that just because we haven't found a solution to something doesn't mean that the solution doesn't exist. So I'm going to be slightly wary and say, will RLWE really be quantum safe? I don't know. So moving on. Why did Amazon send me all this packaging? I have to indulge me for a moment while I find my next film, which is not there. Huh. Is it there? I think it's that one. No, it's not that one. Is it that one? Yeah, it's that one. Will I have sound, sir? We're going? Yeah, we're going. Right, I'm James. Today, we're going to do another quantum experiment. This time, we're going to talk about the polarization of light photons. Here, we've got my daughter Felicity. Yeah. And here, we've got my daughter Clementine. Okay, and outside, what have we got? We've got the cat. <laughs> she that was is very, was definitely very helpful. That is Clementine's cat, and as you can see, she wants to get inside. Girls, does one of you want to empty this box out just to show Amazon's packaging? And what was it they sent us through the post? Well, it was these three tiny pieces of um, polarizing light filter. Okay, now. Let's run our experiment. Girls, if you take one, Clementine, take another. So you take those, take, take, take them over to the window. Okay, so now the girls have got the three light filters. Clementine's got two, and Felicity's got one. Okay, so now Clementine, if you hold one light filter up to the light, that's it, that's good. Now, uh, hold it so that it's facing right towards me. So it's flat towards me, that's good. Okay, now, bring the other light filter up, Clementine, and that's it. Now, they're at right angles to each other, and you can see that where they overlap, no light is getting through. If you just rotate it round again, so it's the other way around, Clem, you can see that when they're in the same orientation, it still lets half the light through. So now, if you put them together the other way around, that's it, hold them tightly against one another, that's it. No light is getting through. One of the filters is stopping all the light, the other filter is stopping the other, all the, the rest of the light. Now, Felicity, get the other filter and hold it in front, so it's touching. You can see still nothing's coming through the two filters that are touching. And on the back, please. Okay, still nothing comes through the two filters. Now, slip it in between the two filters. That's it, brilliant. Now, hold, now twist it. Twist it towards you. Twist it towards you and, and make sure they're tight at the top. Hold it there. Fantastic. Now you can see what's happening. Where there's one filter, some of the light stopped. Where there's three filters, some of the light stopped. Where there's only two filters, all of the light is stopped. Okay. Why? Well, here's the best way I can explain that. So, one filter stops half the light. Two filters perpendicular to one another stop all the light. Introduce a third filter in between and you're now stopping most of the light. What's going on? Well, light travels as photons. The photons have what we can consider to be an alignment. And white light travels with random alignment. So imagine those are the photons approaching that filter. That filter's oriented vertically. They go through the filter. If they're exactly vertical 100% of the time, they'll go through. If they're perpendicular to it, they'll get through never. If they're somewhere in between, they'll get through based on a, a probability of how close they are to being vertical or horizontal. But when they go through that filter, when they emerge, the filter changes their alignment. So all of the photons that go through are now guaranteed to be vertical. So this is a bit like I said earlier. Once you measure something in a quantum system, you understand it now deterministically has one of the values. So, 
after going through the first filter, they're all vertical. So when it hits the second filter, which is at right angles to the first one, nothing gets through. So that's why with the two filters, we see no light emerging. But what about when I introduce the third filter? So the picture remains the same on the left. 50% of the photons go through, but they're now all, 100% of them are aligned vertically. Now I introduce another filter, which is at 45 degrees to the first filter. So each of those photons has exactly a 50% chance of getting through that second filter. So half of them get through. But they're now aligned at that angle. They're no longer straight up, they're at that angle. So when they hit the third filter, which before was perpendicular to the photons, they're no longer perpendicular. So 50% of the photons emerge. So what we end up with is 12.5% of the photons emerging from the, through the three filters. Why is that important? Well, the key to, I shouldn't use the word key, the, the crucial thing about this is that when you observe a quantum state, you may change it. And you have no knowledge and no way of understanding what the quantum state was before you measured it. Those filters can be thought of as a measurement device on the quantum state of the photon. And they will change it unless the photon is exactly aligned. So why is this useful? So BB84 is a provably secure way of exchanging messages. How does it work? Well, Alice wants to send a message to Bob. So they first agree that she's going to send the key as a series of zeros or ones, obviously. She will either send a key like the, uh, a bit that's aligned vertically or horizontally, meaning zero or one like that, or she will send a bit aligned diagonally like that. Bob has no knowledge of which measurement basis she chose to send each bit in. So she chooses a random basis, she sends the key, as you can see. Bob, then, Bob doesn't know what basis was chosen at each stage, so he just randomly chooses a basis himself. So he either measures it in this basis or that basis, okay? If he gets it wrong, he won't get the right measurement, or, well, he'll, he'll have a 50% chance of getting the correct measurement, okay? So as you can see, some of those align, like that, where Bob chose exactly the right basis. Some of them, he chose the wrong basis. He may have randomly got the right measurement, but he chose the wrong basis. Then what they do is, on a public channel, Alice tells Bob what basis was used at each step. She said, I did that, or I did that, on all these steps. And that's public, right? So between them, they then chuck away all the bits where Bob used the wrong measurement basis. Why is that secure? Well, firstly, the length of the key has to be longer than the length of the message. That's to avoid um, pattern recognition in some algorithm. But secondly, if you remember right back at the start when we talked about cryptography, we said that it's crucial for Eve to successfully eavesdrop the message. She has to do it in a way that Alice and Bob didn't know. Now, Alice is perfectly, sorry, Bob, no. Eve is perfectly at liberty to eavesdrop the key exchange part. However, if she uses the wrong basis to measure any one of those bits, it will disturb the bit 50% of the time before it gets to Bob. Because by measuring it, you may change it. So what that means is, Alice and Bob, after the key exchange, can talk to one another on a public channel and say, this 10% of the message uh, of the key should look like this. And if they don't agree, then they say, OK, we'll throw it away, we'll start again. So you continue, you send the key again and again and again until you know it hasn't been eavesdropped. So what you guarantee there, and then you can send your message encrypted using that key over a public channel because you know 100% it cannot be broken. So what you're guaranteeing is a safe key exchange which is, I think, rather beautiful. There are known QKD networks. QKD stands for Quantum Key Distribution. Uh, there's some of them, and I was at a meeting last week in the UK where I found out that the British government is in investing in a QKD network. Uh, apparently, it's going to be up and running soon. So these are real things. 
the Chinese one is exchanging the keys through a satellite. The one problem with that is you have to trust the satellite. So me, personally, I'm not going to use that network. So this is possibly the future of cryptography. This is 100% provably secure. I'm going to finish with a history lesson. You remember those uh, middle-aged white men at the start? Here they are. I apologize for the lack of diversity on this slide. The history as we know it is as follows. Diffie and Hellman published their paper in 1976. That was the first public expression of a, of a key exchange mechanism, of a public key exchange mechanism. RSA came from 1977. Rivesh, Shaw and Edelman, they, uh, they ended up patenting their algorithm, which was interesting in retrospect because the US government uh, forbade the uh, export of anything over 40-bit keys back in the 1980s, which is quite amusing. And it, it actually stopped the uh, American industry uh, to an extent for a while in, in terms of cryptography. But in 1997, because of a, the UK government announced that actually those three people, Ellis, Cox and Williamson, they knew RSA long before it became a public thing. The British government was already exchanging messages using something like RSA at an unspecified earlier point. I don't know how long, uh, and I don't know who knows. Those three probably do, but I think two of them are dead. But my point is this. Right now, we, don't, we think that the biggest quantum computers are about 100 bits, 100 qubits. But a lot of government money, which isn't being declared in the public domain, is being invested in them. Now, I don't think the Chinese secret services, the British secret services, the American secret services, the Russian secret services are going to tell us when and if they've got a quantum computer that's capable of breaking RSA. That's quite scary. And secondly, every message that we are currently sending using RSA encryption is being harvested by all of those agencies around the world. I know that for a fact. So, if you care about your stuff being secure today, tomorrow, next week, stick with RSA. If you care about that message not being read five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, you shouldn't be using it. And that's why I think everybody, the whole world, us as tech leaders, we need to be considering post-quantum cryptography right now. Thank you very much for listening. I've got eight minutes left or seven minutes left if anybody has any questions. There's a hand up there. Do, do we have a microphone for questions or should I go and talk to the guy? Huh? Okay. So what should we do? Okay, the question was what should we do? Um, RLWE, Ring Learning with Errors, is a, said to be a quantum safe algorithm. I think we should be using that. Um, it's, it's implementable in classical computers. There are lots of information online. Uh, Andrew, the guy that I mentioned earlier with his GitHub, he, does, uh, he did a lot of work at university around understanding quantum safe algorithms. They exist, it's just there will be a performance penalty. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, what about symmetric cryptography? I don't know enough about that subject to answer that. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, yeah, uh, perhaps you could elaborate. I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't answer that. Yes, sir. Um, what about the signal protocol? Like the protocol signal and what are, what's it are using there, like a lot bigger than RSA. Is it like same tracks like RSA with quantum? Because it has like a kind of different uh, logic behind it, or it's more like um, safe? Okay, so the question was, what about the signal protocol? So I don't know a full answer to that. Um, my point about the way that encryption works is I think we have to accept that the channel can be eavesdropped, but it's a question of whether the message can be read, and therefore BB84 gives you 100% security on that front. I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but 
Uh, I'm not a cryptographer, to be honest. <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody else? Yes, where? Right at the back. Oh, yeah, I can see you. Yes. Okay, Google, the question was, what does quantum supremacy mean? Google declared quantum supremacy about two or three weeks ago. Quantum supremacy is a concept that was first discussed some time ago. What it means is that there exists, if it's verified, the claim there exists a real-world problem that can be solved more efficiently using a quantum computer, a real quantum computer, than by using uh, any classical computer. So Google's claim is based on the fact that they came up with a, um, a problem, and I think it was to do with uh, using Hamiltonians to simulate uh, energy states and optimize those energy states, and they've demonstrated that they can do that more efficiently in a quantum computer. And the reason why it's exciting is that as soon as quantum supremacy is uh, proved, or at least agreed amongst their peers, there will be a lot more investment in quantum computers because so far financial institutions are investing a lot of money in understanding how to write quantum algorithms. And I've been involved in some of that in the UK. Um, but that's kind of like a research thing, right? Because they, those quantum algorithms to solve financial problems, which are similar to the, the Google thing, I believe, um, we understand how to write them, but we don't have the hardware yet to run them. As soon as we've got the hardware to run them, I believe those big banks will start a race to invest more and more to understand and to build those quantum computers, or to help to build them. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Why the what, sorry? Oh, good question. Why is the carpet people on there? It's a book by Terry Pratchett, as you can see. Um, two reasons. Number one, in the introduction to the book, or at least the edition I've got, says that he first wrote it, um, it was a collaboration between himself at the time that he wrote the introduction that I'm talking about, and his self when he was 17. Because he wrote this story when he was 17, and then when he was much older, and he became a published author, he revisited it and rewrote bits of it. So I kind of think it illustrates um, uh, superposition of states, right? Because the two Terry Pratchett's uh, collaborated. But in the book, there is a description of a race called whites, I think they're called. And those beings can see all of the possible future paths as what's going to happen. And they use that knowledge in a way that is quite interesting. And, uh, and it just, when I was reading it, because at the time I was working with some people in London on, on the quantum computers at UCL, and it just made me think of, of, of superposition and, and the forking paths of, of futures, which, which you are inherent in the many worlds theorem. So it's, I mean, I have no idea if Terry Pratchett had researched quantum stuff, but it, it just, yeah, it was really resonant with me. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> I don't see any hands. Are there any hands up? No? Cool. Everybody, it's been, you've all been great. Antwerp's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for coming, and it's been fantastic. Thank you.